Man, isn't that awesome to look back at our history like that? It's just, it's so cool seeing how God has just continued to be so faithful to our church, what he's brought us through, bringing us up to where we are now. Um, Just awesome. Hey, I wanna welcome all of our home churches right now watching us. Let's give it up for our home churches out there. The rest of our online family joining us. Uh, Hey, I know Pastor Donnie mentioned it just a little bit ago, and I just wanna reiterate it. Worship night coming up. Be there. Be there. It's going to be an amazing time. Why don't you post it right now in the chat? Just say in the comments, a little raised hand, little I'm coming. Just let us know. Uh, uh, I want to know who's coming. I want to know who's coming. I want to know who's excited. It's going to be an amazing, amazing time as we worship together for the first time uh, in person since March. That's just crazy saying that. Um, as we worship together, as we dedicate this building and this property, going to be an awesome, awesome time. I also real quick want to just say our comeback plan is underway. Okay, our comeback plan is underway. Um, we're working on things. We've, we've had an all-staff meeting just this last week with the Cornerstone Church staff planning out when, when we're going to be back and how we're going to do that so, uh, and do it safely. So we've been working on that, and I just want you guys to know that. And also, really quickly, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who has stuck with us and been through us. This has been a trying time for everybody. This has been a trying time. We're a very unique church. We meet in a a government-owned building that we were not allowed to meet in this whole time. And we have had faithful church members stick with us through that. And I am just so thankful for our church. I'm thankful that we have people in our church who view Cornerstone not as something that they just consume, but as something they contribute to that they view this truly as a family. So it's not, oh, well, my family can't meet. All right, well, see you guys later. I'm out. (laughs) But actually stayed here and have been through it with us. I I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough. So round of applause to our whole church family for getting through all of this time together. I'm so thankful, so thankful for everybody. Okay, so today, today, we continue how to survive a horror movie, how to survive a horror movie. So if you've been with us, you know we are using the biblical book of Daniel along with common horror movie motifs and cliches to kind of look at how we can survive horror movie moments in our own life. Because they're going to happen, they're going to come, there's going to be times in life where things get crazy, where things get difficult, and we find ourselves in scary situations, and there are some certain rules that if we follow them, we're going to be able to survive and thrive whatever life throws our way. So if you are ready for today, man, I'm ready. If you're ready, let's bow our heads and let's pray together real quick, all right? Father God, we ask that you would go before us in this moment, that you would sanctify my words, help everything I say today to be coming from you, Lord, not from my own thoughts, my own opinions, but coming from you. And God, I ask that you would be with every single place that this sermon is being played. Every single person who is listening at their hearts would be receptive to hear your word and that we would allow it to transform us and to make us more and more into the image of your son, Jesus. We love you, Father, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, What we did is we started off week one looking at rule number one. Rule number one is listen to the old timer. Listen to the old timer. We were looking at Daniel chapter five uh, and how there's the story of King Belshazzar and uh, the the writing on the wall, right? That like ghostly hand straight out of a horror movie, right? (laughs) That appears on the wall and writes King Belshazzar's sentence. Let's let's him know, hey, you've ignored counsel time and time again. You've ignored the, the warning signs and the things that you should have done this whole time. And now you're about to meet your peril. And we learned how the same thing happens in horror movies and it happens in our lives, that there's old timers in our lives, there's warning signs, there's, there's scared best friends who are like, eh, I wouldn't do that if I were you, I wouldn't go up to that house, I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't get into that relationship, right, I wouldn't do those things. And if we want to survive or avoid horror movie moments in our life, we need to listen to them. <laughs> like, we need to listen to the, the godly wise people that God puts into our lives. We need to listen to their advice. That's rule number one. Rule number two was let's stick together. That's what we talked about and looked at last week. Let's stick together. And we are in Daniel chapter one. And we looked how Daniel and his three friends, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael, they were taken from their homeland of Israel taken from their homeland, brought to a pagan empire that didn't care about God, didn't care about their ways, their customs, or anything, and they're thrust into this situation where they have to decide to either follow God or follow King Nebuchadnezzar, and they're able to follow God, they're able to get through this moment, and the reason they're able to do it is because they stick together. 
They stick together. They realize there's strength in numbers, there's strength in sticking together. And so we talked about how that's the same thing with us, that killers, they always go for the loner. They never just full-on attack the group. They always go for the loner. And if we are going to be wise and if we're going to survive, we need to get ourselves into community as well. So that's rule number two. Now today, rule number three, rule number three, if we want to survive a horror movie, it's never just the wind. It's never just the wind. Put it in the chat. It's never just the wind. In horror movies, in horror movies, there's always a, a loud bang, a, a, a right? Something happens. The scared girlfriend goes, what was that? What was that? The confident boyfriend, don't worry, babe. It's just the wind. It's just the wind, right? It's, that's in like every other horror movie out there. It's just the wind. It's just the wind. And the fact of the matter is, it's never just the wind. It's never the wind. It's always a killer. It's always a ghost. It's always a zombie. It's never just the wind. It's always something terrifying. It's always something that's going to lead to their death. And it's funny because out of all of the rules that we've gone over so far in the series, I have to say, this is the one that I can sympathize with the most because I've been a, it's just the wind person. Like, Numerous times, and this is what I mean. So uh, my wife, Jessica, kind of a scaredy cat. I'm just gonna say it. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that with her, but you are, honey, you're kind of a scaredy cat, <laughs> right? Um, and so I can't even tell you how many countless times we've had the moments where we're laying in bed or we're watching a movie and she'll, what was that? Did you hear that? What was that? And I'm like, it just call, it's nothing. It's probably just the wind or it's something like that. And she, no, 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 what, what was that? And she, she's done that a lot. Right, she's done that a lot. Well, a couple of years ago, I remember she did it. Whatever we were laying down in bed, she, you know, heard something, and I actually, I, to be honest, I heard it too. I didn't know what it was, but I was tired and I could care less. <laughs> like I'm like, I don't know. It's probably what are the chances it's actually something wrong? So I'm laying in bed, and you know, something makes a noise, and she shoots up, and she, Jake, Jake, and she's shaking me, and I'm like, oh. She goes, What was that? Did you hear that? And I. Yeah, no, it's nothing. She goes, no, 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 what was it, what was it? And I'm like, I'm not getting out of this bed. Like, it's too warm, I'm too tired, I'm not getting out of this bed. But rather than saying it's just the wind, because I knew that wouldn't lead to her, like, calming down, I fibbed, I fibbed, your pastor told a lie, I'm just gonna say, I told a lie. So we're laying there, and she goes, no, 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 I, I heard it. And I'm like, it was me, it was me, just go to bed. I, I made the noise. She, she didn't buy it. She didn't buy it for a second, like, not for a second. She goes, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. What, what, what noise was it then? And I'm like, uh. And so I tried to make every possible noise I could with my mouth. I was like, no, it was me. It was, I just went like, uh, uh. like I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make every noise I can, right, to like make her think it was me. And she's like, it was not you. That's not the noise I heard. Go check on it. So I'm like, oh, right, fine. I'll go check on it. And so I go check. It was nothing, right? It was nothing. But if it was something, we totally would have been dead because I am like, it's just the wind. It's just the wind, right? Like that's, that's my nature. So I gotta say, whenever it comes to these rules, this is the first one that I truly do sympathize with these people in the horror movies who, who get got by the killer because I understand it. I understand the inconvenience of checking something out, the inconvenience of acknowledging what's really going on, right? That's inconvenient. There's nothing convenient about that. It's easier to say it's just the wind, now, we're going to see a, a perfect example of that today. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 3. If you have your Bible, you want to open up uh, another tab uh, and search for it online, Daniel chapter 3. Now, this story that we're going to be looking at today from Daniel chapter 3, it takes place 18 years, roughly 18 years, after the story we focused on last week. So last week, that story of Daniel, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael being taken captive uh, from Daniel chapter 1, that happened 18 years ago. So here we are, 18 years, almost two decades down the road from the events of Daniel chapter 1. And in this chapter, we see Daniel's gone. It's, the only, it's, it's like the only chapter in the entire book of Daniel where Daniel is just conspicuously absent. He's not mentioned at all in Daniel chapter 3. And whenever you read chapter 3, you see that it opens up with King Nebuchadnezzar uh, ordering the construction of this big image, this big statue, this golden statue to be constructed. So he orders this statue to be constructed, sends out a pro uh, proclamation. The entire uh, uh, empire, the entire area needs to fall down and worship this idol. They're going to have a call to worship every single day. I'm going to play all this music. Whenever the music plays, that's people's instruction to, hey, bow down in reverence of our God, bow down in reverence of the strength of the empire, bow down in reverence of the king. 
And so the king gets this thing constructed, sends out this proclamation, but there's an issue. And we know the issue because we dealt with the issue last week in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel and his friends, they don't bow down to any other god. They wouldn't eat the food last week because it was defiled and it would be in complete contradiction to God's commands. And so we know where this is going. This is, this is not going to be good. There's going to be a conflict between the king's orders and what Daniel's friends are going to do. And at this point, whenever we're reading today, you're going to notice that there's been a name change, right? They're the artists formerly known as Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael because they've been given Babylonian names. So now they're going as names. You might, if you were in Sunday school, these are going to sound from, uh, more familiar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? If you were in Sunday school, the little felt mark, you know what I'm talking about then, right? You know what I'm talking about. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're suddenly in another horror movie moment. And I've got to imagine that they're, they're saying to themselves, man, this feels a lot like what we've been through before. You remember that? It's, man, it's been like two decades ago, but do you remember whenever we first got here and we were put between a rock and a hard place of do we serve God or do we serve the king? Do we eat this food or do we say no and honor God? What do we do here? And so they're in the same kind of situation again. And so you wonder, okay, well, what are they going to do? Well, we know what they do. We do what falls in line with their character. They do what godly people do. They say, hey, even though, even though this is going to upset him, even though it could mean our lives, we are not going to bow down to this false God. And that's where we pick up in verse chapter 13. That's where we're going to be starting today. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 13. This is what it says. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you will not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, har, uh, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace." then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Wow, right? Talk about a horror movie moment. Talk about a terrifying situation to find yourself in. Now, I gotta, if I'm trying to put myself in their shoes and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if I, if I put myself into their position, it could be tempting to think, you know what? It's nothing. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. It's just the wind. <laughs> it's just the wind. There's nothing to see here. We'll be fine. And you want to know why we'll be fine? Because God gave us favor with the king. Remember? Remember 20 years ago? Remember this happened before. This happened before with the food. And, and we stood up and we said, we're not going to eat this food. We won't defile ourselves with this food. We're, we're going to stay true to God. And because of that, God gave us favor with the king. And we got raises. I mean, we've been shooting up through the corporation, right? Like we, we've been moving up in the administration. God gave us favor. And so, you know what? There's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Nothing's going to happen, though. We'll be fine. It's just the wind. It would have been tempting to think that. And the reason I know that is because that's what you and I do so often. We do this so often. What we do is we cling to God's previous provision even in the midst of current circumstances that are terrifying, right? Well, well, God came through for us this one way, way in the past, and I'm sure he's still gonna do it again. We do this in church all the time, right? Those old worship songs, those are the songs that God moves through, those old ones. We just need to keep doing those old ones over and over. The old hymns, those are the good ones. These new ones, nah. just keep doing the same, the same thing over and over again. That, that was God's provision for us, right? That was God's provision. We need that now. We do it with ministry, we do it with ministry. Man, whenever we, whenever we start up and we meet in person again, we need to do it just like we did it back then because that's how God moved. That's how I came to Christ was through that ministry. And so we just need to keep doing it up until today. God's favor is on that specific style. We got a new building. Great. Let's make it look exactly like our old one. Let's make it look exactly like our old one because God moved through that way. God moved through that design and we just need to bring that into the future. That, that one way that God worked, we're gonna keep holding on to that and clinging on to God's provision that he did in the past and bring it up into today. We do that. We ignore our current circumstances clinging to God's provision that he previously gave us. That's what they could do here is go, you know what, God, God gave us favor with the king in the past, and I'm sure that will translate into today. But that is not how things work. 
For a new moment, we need a new miracle. For a new moment, we need a new miracle. God wants us to rely on him day by day, moment by moment. The way God came through for you in the past is not necessarily going to just get you through the rest of your life. You need to rely on him daily. We see it time and time again in scripture. When God sent the Israelites manna, how much did he send them? Enough for the rest of their life? Enough to take care of them for a month? No, enough for a day. Enough for one day. When Jesus teaches his disciples and teaches us how to pray, what does he say? Give us this day our daily bread. Not enough bread to sustain me for the rest of my life, enough bread for today. God wants to give us new mercies, new miracles every day. And I wanna tell you, you're gonna find yourself in new moments. And in those new moments, you need new miracles. You can't just rely on what God did for you one time in the past and just try to drain that for everything it's worth and ride the coattails of that through the rest of your life. You need to trust God in new ways. You need to step out in faith in new ways and believe in him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are about to find that out. They're about to find out that God giving them favor with the king 20 years ago does not mean they're still gonna have favor today. They're going to have to trust God in new ways. They can't act like this is nothing and it'll just blow over. It's not just the wind. They're going to have to trust God. New moments need new miracles. Put that in the chat. New moments need new miracles. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he says this to them. He, he threatens them, right? He's like, hey, look, you do this or this is what is gonna happen to you. Here's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say in response. And I'm telling you, if you hear what they say in response and you don't wanna run through a brick wall, check your pulse. Check your pulse because this is so good. So the king threatens them and says, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That is like mic drop moment, right? We, we wanna let you know your majesty it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to this false God that you have set up. Man, it just, it makes you wanna charge hell with a water pistol, man, because that, that right there, that is a picture of faith. That's what true faith looks like. That is true faith. This is not faith. No, 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 nothing to see here. It's, it's, I know it's a scary situation, but you know, it's just the wind. It's just the wind, la, 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 it's just the wind. That's not faith, that is denial, that's denial, acting like what's happening in your life, the crazy things going on, the scary situations you find, you find yourself in and acting like they're not happening. There's nothing faith-filled about that. That is denial. That's faith. What we see from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is true faith. True faith is not ignoring the horror movie moment and hoping it goes away. Faith is facing it head on and believing Jesus will be with you in the midst of it. That is true faith. That is true faith. Not ignoring it, not living in denial, but looking it square in the eyes and realizing Jesus will be with me in spite of it. Come what may, I know he is with me. I know he's with me. Uh, the morning of September 11th, uh, 2001, when the, uh, three, uh, the first three airliners were hijacked, what the terrorists said whenever they came over the speaker in the, the cabin to the rest of the plane and what they said to air traffic controllers, essentially what they said was, you know, we, we're, we're terrorists, we've taken control of the plane. Uh, don't try to interfere with us. We have a bomb on board, we'll detonate it. We have a list of demands, we're coming back to the airport. That's what they said. They, they said that specifically to throw people off, to make them think, okay, this is, <laughs> this is a routine hijacking. They, they've got a list of demands, they want money, they want people released from, from government prison, they, they want something like this. Little did we know they would be flying those planes into the Pentagon and into the North and South Towers of the World Trade Center, had no idea. They wanted everyone to stay as calm as they could, right? It's nothing, it's, it's, it's just the wind. It's just, a, it's just a typical, we just want money, just, just chill, don't worry, nothing to see here. But there was another plane that didn't hit its target. And the reason it didn't hit its target is because the people on board knew, no, 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 this isn't just the wind. <laughs> This is something terrifying. This is something bad. They were, received, they were making calls to the ground and they were talking to loved ones who were saying, 
We're watching news footage right now. Two planes have just been flown into the World Trade Center. Another one's hit the Pentagon. And so the people in the plane are going, okay, this isn't, no, this isn't just the wind. This isn't just uh, another hijacking and they're going to try to land us and they're going to try to uh, uh, get a negotiation out of this. This is a suicide mission. And because they knew that, because they knew this is a terrifying situation, and they could have tried to rationalize it. I mean, you've been in scary situations. You try to rationalize it. You try to sugarcoat it. You try to make yourself feel calm by telling yourself lies, right? I've been there. You try to calm yourself down. It would have been easy for those people on the plane to be like, maybe the first three, that was like, that's the threat. This is what we will do if you don't listen to our demands. And maybe that's why we haven't crashed yet. I mean, all the other three have crashed and we're still flying. Maybe it's because... We're the plane that now they're like, okay, now that we have your attention, you will follow our, our demands and you will, will listen to us. So maybe we just sit tight, we just listen to, to what they say and we don't try anything crazy. But see, the people on the plane, like Todd Beamer knew, no, 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 this is not just the wind, something's up, something needs to be done. And so they acted, they acted, they took action. That is Faith, <laughs> that is taking action and saying, no, I'm not gonna try to sugarcoat this to myself. I'm not gonna try to make this situation better than it is and just you know, give myself something to make myself feel good in this moment. No, I'm gonna look the reality of the current situation I'm in and how dire it is and I'm going to face it head on. That is what we need to do. Not sugarcoat our current situations that we're going through. Not sugarcoat the horror movie moments that we may find ourselves in right now in our relationships or in our finances or in our work. No, no, no. Don't sugarcoat it. Face it head on with Jesus at your side. Face it head on. Let's continue. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19. So after they say, hey, look, we ain't, we're not going to do it. We're not bowing down. This is what happens. Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing the robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. Nebuchadnezzar was livid, livid. We just read it. Scripture literally says that his attitude towards them changed. His whole demeanor towards them changed. He was angry. And I think to myself, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego must have been like, even privately to themselves are thinking, you know what? If we, okay, let's, let's do everything we know we're supposed to do. Let's acknowledge that this is, this is a scary situation, but that we're going to trust God in the middle of it, okay? We're going to trust him. So let's stand up to the king just like we did 20 years ago. We're going to stand up to the king and I bet, I bet I know what the response is going to be. The response is going to be just what it was 20 years ago. You know what? You're right. You guys are right. I can't believe I'm asking you to do this, and I shouldn't be putting this on you. That's right. You guys serve, you serve God, and you, you're not going to serve this God. I'm sorry about that. Let's, you know what? Let's, just, let's take the statue down. Like that's, That would have been easy for them to think because it's happened to them before, right? They, they turned away the king's food, and everything worked out for them before. That doesn't happen this time. That didn't happen this time. They stand up to the king, and the king became furious with them. His attitude towards them changed. You see, that's the same thing with us. We can acknowledge that we're in a scary situation. We can acknowledge, okay, yeah, I'm in a horror movie moment, and God, I'm going to rely on you, and I'm going to trust you to get me through it. And that doesn't mean that there still won't be a bad outcome. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we still may not get thrown into the fire, right? Bad stuff can still happen. I know me and Jessica, I've, I've mentioned this before numerous times in services. Whenever we moved to Cleveland to start a church, man, we, we did everything we thought we were supposed to do. We prayed, we fasted, we put our own money towards it, right? We, 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 we acknowledged the situation. We weren't trying to sugarcoat it. We're like, yeah, things are, things are hard. We, for a period of time, we had people attending, but we really didn't have any money. And then it switched, then we lost people, but we were starting to gain money. And it's like, oh man, the, the two things just never really met up and we were going through hard times. And man, we, we would pray, we'd be like, God, even if no one comes, even if no one comes, even if we don't get, uh, we get $1, even if we get $1, we're gonna be here and we're gonna serve you and we're gonna do this because we feel like this is what you're calling us to do. And then Sunday would come, we'd be like, okay, well, we, we kind of thought we'd get more than a dollar. <laughs> like, I know we prayed that, God, but come on now, like, where, where are the people? Where's the money? Come on. Like, I know we said no matter what, right? It's very easy 
to do that. It's very easy to pray and to say like, God, I'm gonna trust you no matter what, but then when the no matter what happens, it's a whole nother ball game. It's easy for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, King, we're not gonna bow down, thinking the king is gonna back off. And when he doesn't, what happens then? When the king gets livid, when the king gets angry, just acknowledging that it's not just the wind and obeying God, that's, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of the horror movie moment. Chances are you may still have to go through a fire or two in your life. That's not the end. It is just the beginning. Continuing in uh, Daniel chapter three. So these men, they, they throw them in, verse 22. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 23, and these three men firmly tied fell in to the blazing furnace. So this is it. This is, this is the horror movie moment. It's, it's the moment that they had to have not hoped that would come to, right? But the moment that they kind of saw coming. Because whenever they heard that, that mandate issued, that everyone needs to bow down, they knew they weren't gonna do it. And they knew, okay, unless something crazy happens, we're gonna end up in the fire. Unless God moves in, a, in an amazing, miraculous way, we are going to end up in the fire. And that's what's so amazing about the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this horror movie moment is they were prepared to go in the fire. Whenever we jump back and we look at what they were talking about in verse 17 and how they were talking to, to the king, notice they didn't say, king, our God is so powerful, he's gonna change your mind. <laughs> He's gonna change your mind and, and we won't even have to face a blazing furnace because he, he, our God, he, he's gonna change your mind and you're gonna see why we shouldn't have to bow down to your false God. And they didn't say, hey, king, you know what? We're not gonna listen to what you say. We're not gonna listen to your mandate. And even if you try to throw us in a furnace, God is gonna, he's gonna provide an escape. We'll be able to get away from you. We'll be able to like slip out of your custody. No, they said in verse 17, hey, we're not gonna do this. And if that means the flames, then Bring it on. But we are not going to violate God's commands. They were prepared for it. There was no, no, nah, no, nah, this, is, this is just the win. Never mind, let's sugarcoat this. Let's make things not seem as bad as they are. No, they, they knew full well what was at stake. They knew how dire their situation was. And even with that in mind, they went forward, trusting God to be faithful, even though they didn't know the outcome, even though they didn't know what it was gonna look like, they're like, you know what, God, we're trusting you and we're believing you. And I think, man, do we need that right now? With everything we're going through, the horror movie moments we're going through, COVID-19 that we're going through. I mean, we, when this thing started back in March, it was a, we thought it was gonna be a two-week break. Oh, nice, like a little two weeks for me to recollect myself and you know, just kind of get things back in order before the world gets back to normal. And it's October, <laughs> like we, it, and we have no idea when it's gonna end. We have no idea. Even countries that it seems like they had it you know, completely stamped out, you're seeing little rises in it across the world. And, I mean, we just, we don't know. We have no idea what the outcome of this is gonna be. The election is coming up, thank God. And I know I'm not the only one who's like, man, can November 3rd get here soon enough so we can just be over with it? But, but the fact is, November 3rd is probably not the end of it, right? It's probably not the end of it. Both sides in one way or another have said like, hey, if, if this thing is really close, then yeah, we're not just gonna concede the election. We're gonna see like, we're, we're gonna have lawyers and we're gonna see what's going on. This thing could go into the new year. Like it could go into the new year. And whenever you think about those things, you're like, oh, no, <laughs> like, no. Like just end COVID, end the election. Can these things be over? Because we are in horror movie moments. And we can take a lesson from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and go, you know what? We don't know how these are gonna turn out, but we do know that they're scary. We know there's a lot at stake with the election. We know there's a lot at stake with our health and with COVID-19 and the crisis. We know there's a lot at stake. We know it's bad, but you know what, God? We're trusting you in the middle of it. We're trusting you and we're gonna follow you and we're gonna be faithful to you and we're gonna do what you tell us to say, even in the midst of it, even though we don't know what the outcome is going to look like, we are going to trust you. And we're gonna have faith that once we get to the other side of it, that we will be in a good place. We'll be in a place where we are thriving, not just surviving, which I wanna read this to you real quick. This is 
So good. This is so good. This is from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Good to Great. Jim Collins, he's an amazing, he's an author, speaker. Uh, He's kind of like a social scientist. And one of the things that he does is he surveys and uh, kind of investigates different companies. Um, He is like consumed with figuring out why certain businesses, why certain leaders are so great and why they succeed and why other companies even though they have everything going for them, seem to fail and why they just can't seem to get out of the way of shooting themselves in the foot, right? So he wrote this book called Good to Great. And one of the people he wanted to interview for his book was a man named uh, uh, James Stockdale. He was an admiral in the U.S. Navy, uh, a very well-known man, actually ran, uh, he was on a vice presidential ticket uh, back, I believe, in the, either the 80s or the 90s. But this is what he said. And I feel like, man, if this doesn't exemplify uh, uh, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and what we need to learn from their story. I don't know what does. So this is from Good to Great. This is Jim Collins writing about uh, James Stockdale. Admiral James Stockdale, who was the highest ranking United States military officer held in the Hanoi Hilton, the prisoner of war camp uh, during the height of the Vietnam War. Admiral Jim Stockdale was tortured over 20 times during his eight-year imprisonment from 1965 to 1973. Stockdale lived out the war without any prisoner's rights, no set release date, and no certainty as to whether he would even survive to see his family again. He shouldered the burden of command, doing everything he could to create conditions that would increase the number of prisoners who would survive the camp unbroken, while also fighting an internal war against his captors in their attempts to use the prisoners for propaganda. At one point, get this, at one point, Admiral Stockdale beat himself with a stool and cut himself with a razor, deliberately disfiguring himself so that he could not be put on videotape as an example of a well-treated prisoner. Jim Collins is getting ready to meet Jim Stockdale to interview him for this book, and he decides, you know what, I'm going to read Admiral Stockdale's book. Admiral Stockdale had written a book, and he's like, you know what? I'm getting ready to interview him. I want to just know more about his background. I want to know more about his story so I can come in and inform him. So he starts reading his book one day. They're getting ready to meet at Stanford University. So he starts reading his book, and he says, as I moved through the book, I found myself getting depressed. It just seemed so bleak, the uncertainty of his fate, the brutality of his captors. And then it dawned on me, here I am, sitting in my warm and comfortable office, looking out over the beautiful Stanford campus on a Saturday afternoon, I'm getting depressed reading this and I know the end of the story. I know he gets out. I know he reunites with his family. He becomes a national hero. He gets to spend the later years of his life studying philosophy on this very campus where we're about to meet. If it feels depressing for me, how on earth did he deal with it when he was actually there and did not know the end of the story. What Admiral Stockdale, if you listen to one part of today's message, I hope you listen to everything. If you listen to one part, this is when to tune in. This is when to turn the volume up. This is what Admiral Stockdale said whenever he was asked, how, how did you handle this? How on earth did you get through this if you didn't know the end of the story? This is what Admiral Stockdale said. I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out but also that I would prevail and in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade for anything. I couldn't speak for many minutes. Finally, after a long silence, I asked him, Jim, who didn't make it out? Oh, that's easy, he said. The optimists. The optimists? I don't understand, I said, now completely confused. Admiral Stockdale said, yeah, the optimists. Oh, they were the ones who would say, we're gonna get out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and Christmas would go. Then they'd say, we're gonna be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving, and then it would be Christmas again. The optimist died of a broken heart. Another long pause, then he turned to me and said this. Jim, this is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. I'm gonna read that again. You must never 
confuse the faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose. You can never afford to lose that you know how this story will end with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Put another way, it's never just the wind. It's never just the wind. Don't sugarcoat where you're currently at. Don't sugarcoat, don't, don't just be a glass half full and completely ignore what's really going on in your life. It's never just the win. Yes, keep faith in the end of your story, but make sure you keep focus on your current circumstances. Make sure you keep focus on your current circumstances of what's going on because if you try to sugarcoat it, you try to act like it's not that bad, you think you can do it on your own. But whenever you realize, wow, this is a scary situation. Wow, this is terrifying. Wow, I can't do this on my own. It forces you into the discipline of relying on God to get you through. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have thought, you know what? We've had favor with God. We can talk our way out of this. And he's given us favor with the king. They realize, no, 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 this, this is bad and we're going to need him. We're gonna need his help. We can't do this on our own. And the same is true for you and the same is true for me. Keep faith in the end of your story, but keep focus on your current circumstances. Do not lose sight of it. So how does their story end? How, how does Daniel's, uh, the, the story end of his friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and he asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched. There was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God other than their own. Amazing, amazing end to a story of amazing people filled with amazing faith in God. What I wanna close this out with today is just this one, one last thing. So they come out of the fire and the fire has not touched them. Again, this is what scripture says. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched. There was no smell, not even the smell. If you've ever been in a bonfire, you know you don't have to be anywhere near the fire and you come home stinking of smoke, right? Nothing was touched. The fire did not touch them at all. But you wanna know what the fire did burn. The only thing the fire burned were the ropes that had them bound. You notice that? They went into the fire bound. They went into the fire with ropes around their hands. And what's the first thing Nebuchadnezzar says Wait a second, didn't we throw three men in the fire because there's now four men walking around free and unbound, unbound. So you wanna know what that means? You wanna know what that means? That means that the fires that you go through, the trials that you go through, if you trust God in them, you acknowledge them for what they are, scary situations, you don't sugarcoat it, you acknowledge it for what it is and you trust God through it. If you do that, the fire won't burn you it will actually free you. The fire won't burn you. It will turn you more into who you're supposed to be. It will burn off the things that have you held down. It'll burn down the things that have you uh, strapped back. That's what the fire can do whenever you trust God. So these horror movie moments, as Admiral Stockdale said, these horror movie terrifying moments, they can become the defining moment of your life that in retrospect, if you had the choice, think about this. This is a man who spent eight years in a Vietnamese prisoner of war camp. He said, I look back now and I would not trade those eight years for anything because it became the defining pivotal moment of my life. The same can be true for you because the same was true for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That became the pivotal moment of their life in the midst of their fire, in the midst of their horror movie moment. And I wanna let you know, 
it can become your pivotal moment. You can go into the fire. You can go into this terrible situation with, with, with dysfunctions that have you bound, with addictions that have you bound, with, with relationships that are marred that have you bound, with financial issues that have you bound. That's how you can enter the fire. And you, if you follow God, you can come out on the other side unbound, free. The only thing that the fire touches is the thing that was holding you down. That's, that's what can happen for you. <laughs> that's what you, it can happen. You just have to trust God. You just have to trust God. You have to follow him and you have to realize, you know what? This is a scary situation. I can't do this on my own. I'm not gonna downplay this. It's just the wind. I can do it on my own. No, God, I need you. I need you. And if I follow you, this, this horror movie moment, it can become the defining moment of my life. If you want that, I wanna pray with you real quick. Father God, we are thankful for who you are, that you are a God who is with us in the fire, not a God who has to just deliver us from the fire, but you can deliver us through the fire. You can deliver us through it. And in the midst of it, even in the midst of those terrifying moments, God, you can, you can change us and you can work on us and you can make us more and more into who we're supposed to be. You can burn off our dysfunction. You, you can burn off our addictions, all the things that are trying to hold us down, God. You can do that. You can take what the enemy meant for evil and use it for good. So God, what we ask for today is we ask for the courage to be able to acknowledge when we find ourselves in horror movie moments. It can be so tempting for us to act like nothing's going on, that you know what, it's okay, it's okay, I can handle, I can handle, it's not that bad. God, help us to be able to see the severity of our current situation, see the severity in the depth of our need for a savior, the depth of our need for someone who will walk through the fire with us, and then God, to put our faith and our trust in you so that as we go through our horror movie moment, we can come out on the other side in a better position than we went in it. We can't do it on our own, God. We ask for your help today, and we will give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And it's in your name that we pray. And everyone said in agreement. Amen. Amen. Can we give it up for our God?